first trading session of this holiday shortened week. Here's what's coming up in the next 55 minutes. More hope for the Naira as the Central Bank of Nigeria is set to sell $10,000 each to BDCs at uh, 1,101 Naira per dollar. And in Kenya, fees on unused external loans hit 834 million shillings. And Egypt's annual urban consumer price inflation rate slows to lower than expected level 33.3% in March. And it's great to have you join us. I'm Ladi Williams. Let's kick off now with some of the markets uh, that we track here, starting with the oil market. Uh, we see oil prices fall more than a dollar barrel um, today, with Brent sliding under um, that $90 level as Middle East tensions um, eased after Israel withdrew more soldiers from southern Gaza and committed fresh talks on a potential ceasefire uh, in the next uh, six months. So we see, uh, yeah, losing that $89, uh, that $90 um, level, trading at $89.69 a barrel, down 1.6%, uh, a big drop. WTI crude still holding above the $80 level. That's trading at $85.54 um, a barrel, also down by one5 uh, percent. Investors will be scouring consumer price index data from U.S. and China, and uh, that's due later this week for further clues on the timing of possible Fed rate cuts and to gauge the economic health of the world's top two oil consumers. To other markets now, we see uh, the metals market gold prices rose um, today. On the flip side, that's uh, taking the attention right now to hit the seventh consecutive uh, session. We see gold, $2,359.90 um, uh, per ounce, up 0.60%. Silver has not left out. A bigger move up, 1.66%, uh, $27.96 uh, uh, per ounce. And we see palladium um, also uh, trading big there, 1.60% up. Official sector uh, demand from Asia, despite traditional headwinds from a stronger U.S. dollar and elevated uh, interest rates, that we see that um, pushing the metals market up. So on the flip side, we'll see the oil market um, uh, pull back, but we're seeing the metals market there um, gaining. And uh, back here, the Central Bank of Nigeria has issued a circular to BDC operators, informing them of a sale of $10,000 each at a rate of 1,101 naira to the dollar. According to the circular, each BDC is instructed to sell the dollars um, to eligible customers at a rate not exceeding 1.5% above the purchase price. This suggests BDCs are not expected to sell above 1,117 naira to the dollar. The selling rate is below the $1,251 recorded at the end of last week, according to data from the Nigerian Autonomous Foreign Exchange Market. That's nothing. And the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Commission has asked the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission to mandate um, distribution companies to meter all unmetered Band A customers within 60 days. The commission made this known in a statement signed by its acting vice chairman and chief executive officer, uh, Mr. Adamu Abdullahi, on Sunday. Mr. Abdullahi explained that unless a, con uh, a consumer of um, Band B, C, D, and E, the disco should not be allowed to migrate such a consumer to a higher tariff ban to avoid um, any exploitation. He added that um, NEC should enforce cap on estimated bills and ensure compliance with required daily supply for respective tariffs uh, bans A to E. Meanwhile, FCCPC has commended uh, the recent enforcement action by NERC against the Abuja Electricity Distribution Company for violating the supplementary order to the multi-year tariff order that's for 2024, which mandated discos to reimburse all customers in bands B, C, and D, and E who were billed above the allowed tariff bands and pay a fine of 200 million naira. Well, dealing with over 18.6 billion people whom the World Food Program have said are food insecure in Nigeria requires innovative techniques. And one of such is according to uh, MDCO Big Farms concept, Mr. Adibawale, um, Onofor of hydroponics. While this is a growing practice, Mr. Onofor says recent government policies are deterring its spread and benefit. Take a listen. Government support had not been there at the initial stage, but over the time, I think a number of few things are coming. But uh, there is this problem of policy term assault. Sometimes in 2017, there was a policy that says when you import greenhouses into Nigeria, it comes as zero duty. 
by 2020, somebody changed that. We had a meeting with the director of horticulture sometimes last year with the hotel, and it was like he was also shocked to see that somebody had changed that singular policy that you now have to pay. Now, in many climes, go to China, go to some other countries, farmers are supported by simple policy uh, subsidies like that. You import greenhouses, you don't get to pay uh, duty for it so that it comes cheap and people can settle. And these are some of the ways I think government can support. Look at fertilizers. Sometimes in 2017, 2018, there's a particular fertilizer called passion nitrate. These are soluble fertilizers. They are IN fertilizers. They are what we use in the greenhouse. A bag of calcium nitrate as of 2018 was 8,005. As I talk to you now, that same bag of calcium nitrate is 55, 60,000. A bag of potassium nitrate in 2018 was 9,000 naira. Today is 85,000. Now, what led to this? There was a change in the policy that all oh, these fertilizers are being used for bone manufacturing and all that. Some said fertilizers are being manufactured in Nigeria. But these are not the type of fertilizers you manufacture in Nigeria. Well, in the first quarter of 2024, the Monetary Policy Committee of the Central Bank uh, of Nigeria has increased interest rates by 600 uh, basis points already in a bid to tame inflation and stabilize the FX market. But let's gauge the expected impact on the uh, home development and um, ownership in uh, 2024. Um, joining us for that conversation now is uh, Satunde Balogu, is the CEO of a small, small. Join us right here um, in the studio. Great to have you. Thank you for having me, Ladi. Yeah, so, yeah, quite a um, big jump. There yeah, are big hikes we've seen uh, for interest rates. And, you know, globally, we, we did see interest rates actually go up. And we see how that impacted the mortgage markets mm -hmm. in more developed economies. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we're seeing their inflation starting to, you know, hit their targets. That's the central banks in, you know, most of those countries. But we know inf uh, the, the interest rates are still quite high. Mm. But investors are expecting some kind of rate cut, mm. you know, in 2024. But back here in Nigeria, we're not really looking at rate cuts at this time because inflation yeah, is still fair. very, very high. Mm. So talk to me about, I paint a picture of how this is, um, the, the, the interest rates we've seen, this hike now, mm. how is it impacting um, growth, the real estate sector currently? I mean, it's interesting because when you look at the economy of Nigeria or any, any part of the world, real estate <coughs> is supposed to be a force, a major player, right. you know, and that's why in most developed um, parts of the world, real estate is one of the top three contributors to the GDP. But we don't have that in Nigeria. It has never been that. And when you now think of the times that we are in where the economic challenges are higher, you now begin to question that when are we going to get there as Nigeria, right? Um, but one of the primary challenge that exists in the real estate market today is for most developers, um, they usually don't know what their start cost is and what their finish cost is. You know, it will be a better situation if people developers now, if they get into project or, or construction and they know this is what I'm starting with and this is what my project cost is going to be at the end of it, right? But when you have a situation where um, the cost of funds, the, there is increase in rates in terms of uh, loans they've taken from banks, you know, NPR is going, going up, the banks are coming back to them and saying that, oh, this rate has to go up as well. Then it begins to affect the cost of the finished product, which is the, the property itself. And that's why you see a lot of developers get into trouble because they've taken loans, um, rate has gone up, and they are struggling with the project. And they have to go back to the people that bought the project, even if they had sold that off plan to say, oh, we need to adjust price. And these people also, the consumers or the buyers, they also don't want to give in to that. So you have a situation whereby, oh, it's either the project is abandoned, bank is on the developer's case to, to get back their money. And if it's a mortgage company that is providing a loan to the a mortgages, mortgage bank in Nigeria, even the way they are structured, you look at how they provide uh, mortgages, right? A lot of them don't want to engage in traditional mortgage. They are set up as mortgage bank, but when you look at the core of the business they are doing, they are not really doing mortgage. Mortgage is only about 5-10% of their books. And it's all because of this fluctuation, this instability. So it, it's a major problem. Right. And, and when I look at, you know, uh, uh, property prices, you mm -hmm. know, at this time, um, I believe somebody that was uh, maybe that entered a coma, mm -hmm. say, maybe, maybe five years ago or so, mm -hmm. 
and you know wakes up today to see the, the current prices you know of properties in Nigeria. Because I remember at a time, you know, you could get a detached house in say Chevron mm. for about sixty million. You know, there was a time. <laughs> yes, yeah, you're not right. So far not away. too far away, yes. Not too yeah. far away. Yeah. But now in that same area, mm. you're seeing detached houses for about three hundred million, mm -hmm. you know, two hundred million. Or even way more than or that. Or even way more than that. Yeah. And I'm wondering how do how do we how can we even talk about affordability, yeah. you know, at a time like this of, of housing? So here's the thing, right? A um, few years ago, probably 2016, 2015, I used to say that one bedroom uh, or two bedroom in Lekki Phase 1 should not be more than 15, 20 million, you know, because of where I was coming from, right? And I believe that these are starter homes where a young family or a young person that has a decent job should be able to use to start up their life before they... Uh, before they move into a four bedroom or a five bedroom, right? Um, but when you look at one, what one bedroom is selling for in Lekki phase one today, which is around over 100 million, you know, if it is ready built, if it is off plan, then you can get it probably like 70 million, 80 million, right? Then I used to say like, it's ridiculous why we are selling one bedroom for like 30 million. But because I've, I've now been a player in the space in Nigeria for the past few years, I've now understood and seen what the challenges are, right? It's easier, it's very easy to, blame developers and say that, oh, how come price was like 100 million, uh, 60 million in VGC and now it's 300 million. But when you look at the dynamics, the factors, that's when you really understand the problem, right? Uh, one of the problem in Nigeria, and I continue to say this is, the biggest problem we have is distrust. And that distrust creates a lot of things. It fuels greed and it fuels bad governance as well, right? Before it will be greed that fuels distrust, right? But when distrust now becomes the norm, it now begins to, so someone that has integrity, someone that is not greedy, when you look at the societal norm and factors, then you question yourself that, does it make sense for me to have integrity in this country? Does it make sense for me not to be greedy in this country? And I'll tell you where I'm going with this point, right? I know a lot of people that once they earn their salary, they immediately change it to dollars. They immediately, before they even start spending, right? When you look at, they, you'll be like, are these people not patriotic about Nigeria? Are they not patriotic Nigerians, right? It's not, it's not because of that. It's because they, by the time they look at the realities of things, right, and what is gonna cause them to do certain things, they realize that they will be at disadvantage if they keep their Naira. But then, one of the things that is happening right now is what the current gov government is doing. I, I think what we should do as citizens is we can build on it. There has been a lot of distrust from government it, between ourselves, but I think we are heading the right direction now. And the citizens, have, they have a role to play as well. And the role we need to play is whereby we begin to, if, I'll give another example. A typical real estate transaction, right? You've signed agreement. This is the price of the property. Then the developer comes back to you and say, oh, because of things that has gone up and all of that, right? I can't sell at this price anymore. Let's re-evaluate re the price. And, and the buyer is telling you, no, I can't do that, right? But now dollar is coming down, um, dollar is coming down right? So it means that Naya is gaining, right. right? So what then should happen? It also means that costs should go down, right? But because there's a, um, a something called replacement cost, a developer will tell you that for me to replace, even if I sell this property at a certain price, for me to be able to go back to market and buy it, there's a replacement cost. Therefore, I cannot buy it at the same price I bought it when I was building the old project, right? So one of the advice I'll give to developers is that instead of you going back to sellers, right, to say, oh, I need to review my price, evaluate my price, right, it should start from your agreement, and the type of purchase agreement you sign should say that should the economy go or costs go beyond a certain price point, then we can come back to the table and review things. Consumer don't want, we typically don't want that, but by so doing, your inter integrity, you can, you might have the 100 buyers that want to buy from you and only 10 are able to buy from you based on that um, policy that you've put in your agreement, right? But you are able to keep your integrity rather than someone saying that, oh, I don't want to pay, pay the new price and the developers on the other side also say, oh, I'm not building anymore because you don't want to um, pay the new price, right? And then project gets, comes to a stand Right. which is, is what you see everywhere. So we have a, a role to play as citizen in how we engage each other. And that's what you see in marketplace as well, where everybody's saying that, oh, but dollar is going, you know, things are changing now. Why has prices not changed, right? 
that greed element is where we need to interpret the reality of the economy into how we price product right. as well. Where a market person knows that, oh, things are now changing the market. I need to um, re 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 reprice to, um, to establish or to reflect the current market price rather than trying to hold on to it and be greedy right. and saying that, oh, I want to make as much money as possible. That is my take on the, the whole economy as a whole, whether from the government or also the citizen side, we need to come. We all need to play our part in order to drive things forward in this country. Right. When you are patriotic and you are changing your money to dollars and all of that, you, you need to tell yourself, how is that benefiting my country? I can't be patriotic. I understand my economic uh, realities. But at the same time, if me using Naira to buy dollars just for me to keep and save is not helping this country, then... Right. How? What? Yeah, where does my patriotism come whoever, to play? Whoever uh, uh, is doing that, you mm -hmm. know, at this time is definitely oh, they are at a loss, yeah. You know, right now. <laughs> yes. So I guess betting against the Naira is quite um, risky, right? You now, know, at this yeah. time, but what we're mm -hmm. seeing with the interventions, mm -hmm. you know, by the central bank. But but looking at, um, you know, it just seems like you can't throw the word affordability, mm -hmm. you know, around at this time the way things look. But what do you think are the solutions, you know, mm -hmm. right now to make homes? you know, within reach, you know, for the average Nigerian, you know, at this time, even though we see inflation and mm. um, the currency is strengthening, though, but mm. still quite uh, devalued, mm. you know, according to some people. I think everything starts with goodwill um, from the government. Um, policy, needs, strong policy needs to come into play, place and then enforcement of those policy also needs to come to play. I think there's willingness already from the government to, here is one of the things I have observed over the years, right, that. Nigeria's situation, it won't take angel dropping down uh, to come and solve our problem or people that have angelic heart to come and solve our problem. It's going to be a progression, you know, and the progression I see is what I've seen in, in, lot of, in a lot of Asian countries where you have people that come to power, even though they are going to use the power to benefit themselves, but they are also going to do the work. What we've seen in Nigeria over the years is where people that come into power that only benefit themselves, but they don't really do the work. So they benefit themselves 90% and only do 5, 10% work. But what is going to happen is, what I am seeing with this government is, where they might benefit themselves, they might surround themselves with people that will benefit themselves, but I think there's willingness to see a change uh, and to um, uh, put the, um, engage, um, provide the change, right? That's policy coming to play, right? The second part is once you have policy in place, good policy and enforcement of those policies, things begin to normalize and stabilize, right? And how that will translate into developers because developers are the, uh, are the suppliers. So they determine what comes into the market and also a lot of other factors that are now playing in the market. So I'll come to the mortgage um, providers, right? So once that we have that stab stability, a developer can do his fin financials and say, this is what it will cost me to deliver, a, to start a four bedroom. And this is what it will cost me at the end of it, right? That stability is needed. Right now, we don't have that stability. And a lot of people, a lot of developers are in trouble because of that. And it, when people wake up, developers wake up between yesterday and today and can change price 25%, 30% just because that's the market reality, right? But that stability will bring about that change. On the mortgage side or the people that are supposed to provide access to financing for end consumer to own homes, right? Uh, I think it should trickle down to them as well. The sad reality about the mortgage in Nigeria, again, we need to look at the policy that guides mortgage in Nigeria. I think the mortgage banks, um, they are not in really interested in the business of mortgage providing mortgage. But their money is not patient at all. <laughs> yeah, it's not. So, of course, There's you no look patience. at where do they get their funding from, you know, even when they get the, a good funding source, right? Because of also they are not so confident in the economy and the realities of the economy. So they look at alternatives where to put that money and get return as quickly as possible. So stability of government policy, developers' stability, and then policy also need to come into play in the mortgage space whereby mortgage banks are actually providing mortgages to people at good rates right but i mean that's where my company comes in right now because we are providing alternative mortgage um we are not going to sit around to you know 
wait until these changes happen um, because in a lot of other climbs as well, what you see is that where there are problems that are predominant in, in the market that are change, that is not really making the market drive as much as possible, which particularly in the area of housing, then you have alternative players that come into the market and bring about solution. Because housing is a basic human well, need. Well, I'd, I'd like to see you know mm. real 30-year mm. mortgages you know yeah. at some point, 20 yeah. years, mm. you know, instead of this uh, really short yeah. you know, mortgage that mm. we see at this time, too expensive yeah. and also um, the rates you're paying for. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, we've been talking to Tunde Balogun, CEO mm. of Small Small. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you Ladi. It's good to be here. All right. So we'll take a break now. When we come back, we head straight to the market. We're talking about the global markets and the local boss right here in Nigeria. Do stay with us. Heads uh, straight to the markets now. We have Anete uh, with the details as the shortened um, is a holiday shortened week uh, right here in Nigeria. But uh, Anete is going to give us the details. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Ladi. Yes, another week, second week of April. I think the month is um, on uh, on speedboat or uh, or skates, if you like. I, I call it that way because. We just said uh, Happy New Month just last week, and then today is already 8th. It's moving really And fast. very soon we're going to move into the middle of April. And, of course, time waits for no man. Exactly. So it's time you put your money where your mouth is and put it at the right time because of inflation and other factors. Right. All right. So now let's take a look at um, our intraday analysis for the markets across uh, Africa. Uh, we, we talk about four major uh, markets across the African continent. First, starting, of course, uh, charity begins at home, like they say. So at intraday, mixed trading sentiments for, uh, for the trading day Africa, but mostly positive. But Nigeria's stock market has been oscillating. Last week, we saw three days of um, um, three uh, negatives, which we saw the market making a pullback when it resumed from the Easter holiday, but welcoming it with profit taking. And of course, 622 billion naira was knocked off, was a brutal week, 1.04 and 1.05% pullback for the OSHA index as well as the market capitalization. But as at Monday, 0 0.01, just a tad there, is still oscillating and we're still within the, the 103,000 points level. Wow, for the South Africa Stock Exchange, where we see uh, still a green color there, 0.33%. On the other side of the African continent uh, market, we see Egypt also more than a, a half of a percent in the green, uh, green territory, while Kenya Stock Exchange closed Friday down 0.06%. Now let's talk about money this time, and we talk about the was um, the the supernatural currency, the dollar. What we see trading of the FMDQ market, it closed as at uh, Friday, April the fifth. It closed down um, down by more than 52 percent, 52.88 percent, at about 918. Point one five million dollars all traded across the FX spot, the Ford and the FX derivatives market. So that was why the market had a pullback. And not to mention that the that the country's forex reserve, as of last week, made some pullback 
all, all, all thanks to the central bank's intervention at the foreign exchange market. Now, so talking currency, Nigeria's um, dollar, the, the Naira, has been making some gains all the way from the 1,700 level. It's still making strong gains. We can see the impact of the central bank's intervention at the, uh, at the money market, at the, the, the country's foreign exchange market, where we see 7.56% week-on-week performance for the market previously at about 1,367 naira, one couple, two, as of last week, Friday, 1,270.87 couple. Now we, we heard the, the latest news, which Ladi just mentioned a couple of minutes ago, that the central bank is selling the dollar to the naira, the destroy selling the naira against the dollar at about 1,000 101 naira against the dollar, but we'll be having, I guess, to talk more about that. But before we get there, let's take a look at what we're to expect within this week. First of all, the markets will be on holiday for the Muslim Eid holiday. They call it the Eid al Fitr, where we'll be seeing uh, April 9th and 10th will be a public holiday so no trading for the financial markets for the capital market for the fixed income market so traders will be on holiday and then on on thursday initially it's supposed to be on wednesday we'll be having the central bank rollover more than 56 billion naira worth of maturities that's for the treasury bills market so it's called the ntb the pme so they'll be having that on thursday um on thursday the 11th with um about 149 billion worth of maturities on offer. At the same time, money market, the overnight rate is expected to continue to rise on possible net issuance from the Thursdays. Uh, well, it was initially supposed to be on Wednesday, but this time it will be on Thursday. On the other side of what to expect on the market, we, we still see that um, for the bonds market, the players are expected to reshuffle their portfolio uh, in anticipation of the PMA with increased supply expected and as sequel to last week, where we see the debt management office uh, release the, uh, the bonds uh, calendar for the second quarter. Of course, they, they mentioned that about 1.18 trillion is what they expect that uh, they will be, their debt targeting to raise from the bond issuance. And then for the treasury bills market, we expect that the yields will increase further amid anticipation of tight liquidity conditions. Now for the final ones, we see that the, for the equities market, I mentioned that last week we saw a uh, kind of a choppy session. We had so many profit taking, of course, at the same time, we also saw portfolio rebalancing, which is why the, the market was in the red, because already they're anticipating that the, the first quarter results will begin to trickle in. So investors are already making their portfolio rebalancing ahead of the first quarter results by some companies. Now let's talk more about the fixed income markets. And we have our guest analyst with us here, Senator Audu fixed income trader at Access Bank for details of the Naira dollar exchange parity. Thank you for joining us, Senator. Thanks for having me, Anita. Okay, yeah, uh, Senator, now I'm sure you've heard about this story, there's more of a developing story, official statement from the central bank says uh, they're selling to BDCs, the, do the, the dollar, you know, $10,000 to each BDCs at uh, below the market rate of about a 1,101 uh, Naira against the dollar. So how is this impacting the, fixed, the forex market as we speak? Yeah, so as you rightly said, the uh, circular was, uh, communication was released by the CBM this morning, where about 1,588 BDCs will be sold um, $10,000 each by the CBM. And the republished for that sale is 1,101 Naira. And um, the BDCs are allowed to sell 1.5% above or below that rate. So uh, the, the highest rate that can be sold is about 1,117 um, Naira. So this, this just lends um, credence to the CBN's drive to, of course, um, stabilize exchange rates um, uh, across all markets. Um, so this, this um, we, we had expected this, that last rate was at 1,200 levels. And today said it's about it's at 1,100 levels. So we have seen, um, with regards to reaction in the official market, we've we've seen market players mostly remain um, relaxed and um, and calm. We've we've seen a steady decline in rates from um, Friday's levels of 1,255 naira in the um, NIFEX market. We've seen a steady decline in that rate. Um, concluding today, we'll see where it's close, but we do expect a steady um, appreciation. From uh, those rates in the official market, so we, we are seeing some of those moves in the unofficial market or the, or the BDC the, um, authorized dealers filter into the um, the, the uh, NIFM as the Nigerian Autonomous Foreign Exchange Market. 
Mm, okay. So talking about the NAFEM and also the NAFEX where we see the Naira making some strong gains now, uh, my question is, uh, how sustainable do you think this firming or strengthening of the Naira will continue? Are we going to see the Naira fall even below maybe 1,000 in a very short time from now with the CBN's interventions? Uh, is, is, an event, if, if, is there anything to go by? Okay, as the CBN governor has um, originally said, he um, it's, it's not something the CBN can do alone. It's something that um, everybody has to put hands together, the fiscal side, as well as um, the institutions and individuals in the country to, to make this happen. The CBN, on their own part, they sustain these interventions. We've seen a steady decline of rates from um, very high levels to these um, levels, welcome levels that we are seeing in the market. With regards to um, fillers that we are getting from our international and local counterparties, uh, we, uh, there's there's the sense that people are pleased, parties are pleased with the decline in rates. With, how, uh, with regards to how sustainable it is, we do believe that uh, with the confidence that the, the CBN is inspiring, we, we will see support from FDIs and FPIs um, coming to our markets. The CBN, has, uh, the CBN and DMO have, have also sustained interest rates to make these rates um, attractive to these international counterparties. So on the CBN side, um, they are doing as 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 well as they can, and we are seeing contributions as well from foreign portfolio investors as well as foreign direct investors. Mm, okay, Senator. So I think uh, let me just ask you, just in thirty seconds, what's your expectation for uh, the, for the market when the market resumes on Thursday? Um, on Thursday, the, there was supposed to be the NTB auction that you mentioned on Wednesday. The uh, communication was released today that that auction will now be held on Thursday. So the NTB auction holds on Thursday. With regards to expectations around rates, again, the DMO, the debt management office, and the CBN um, are in agreement that rates are currently around above the 21% handle. So we do expect that on the long end, rates will remain at those levels. Right. So with regards to the bond calendar being released, the auction is to hold on Monday. We expect rates to close at about those same levels as well, 20% levels. Uh, the three bonds on the the 29th, the 31st, and the 34th. And we expect rates to close um, at between um, 20, 20 to 20.5% 20 at those options. Mm. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Senator. So we, I think we'll leave it there until Thursday. That was um, Senator Aldu, Forex and Fixed Income Dealer at Access Bank with details of the fixed income market. Now, over to the world's biggest economy, but before that, we should have had the Middle East uh, economy, uh, the Middle East markets. Now, okay, okay, so now we're back to the Middle East market. It's um, mostly mixed sentiment, but for the UAE stocks, there's the Abu Dhabi and the Dubai, both in the red, by just slim margins in, in negative territory. But this is all at intraday. We'll soon we'll be seeing how the market turns out at the close of trading, most likely by uh, in, in days come. Now, let's move over to the other sides of the market. The Saudi Stock Exchange, as the title wool, is up by 0.66%, while the Qatari Stock Exchange is also up a tad 0.06%. Now, back to the U.S. market where we see mostly higher is coming from the last week. We saw most, most of the uh, choppy session, but Friday's um, trading came in rather in the positive terrain because, of course, the, the March inflation, the, the March employment number came in stronger at about 303,000. So investors were reacting positively to that. And that's why you see the markets, um, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, in almost, um, well, not too, not too far away from the 1%, while the S&P 500, more than 1%, 1.1%, and the NASDAQ, uh, the, tech, uh, the, the, the tech index for, for the U.S. market, 1.24%. Now, of course, investors, are, uh, they, they will be expecting that the March uh, uh, consumer price index will be released on Wednesday. So their eyes out for that, as well as uh, so, so many, some other um, if uh, so many other data, Ladi, uh, at the moment, uh, if I couldn't gra grab my hand on uh, some of the, the data, yeah, but for of, now, yeah. that's what we have. Yes, yeah, so uh, we're looking at CPI um, coming from the U.S. and I think um, also uh, China. Mm, Thank you China. so much, Anita. The two, the two of the world's biggest economies, biggest first economies. and the second. Right. Thank you so much Pleasure. Uh, for the details there um, in those markets. Well, let's um, take it on to London now. We have Juliana joining us from our London studio uh, great to have you, uh, Juliana. Happy New Week. So we've seen um, eBay has dropped uh, fees for the sale of uh, secondhand um, clothing on its platform. I, I guess that's uh, good news. 
It is good news. Good afternoon, Laddie. A pretty surprising move by eBay this morning. Of course, eBay are one of the world's largest online market platforms. What you can do is basically sell new goods or your unwanted goods on there. But they have made this bold move and decided that from now on, so from today, if you are going to list any secondhand clothes on the store, then you don't have to uh, use a seller fee, which I think is really important. And there are two aspects to this story. I think the first one is that eBay, of course, are trying to keep up with their competitors, as we've seen with the embattled high street here in the UK. It has been really difficult for some traditional brands to try and keep up with some of these fast online fashion brands. And eBay is having the same issue because in the UK, there are lots of applications, um, some that come to mind like Depop and Vintage, where younger consumers go on there and they are basically swapping their clothes at a much cheaper rate. So eBay have decided if they want to um, become and maintain the attraction, then they are going to have to compete and removing this fee is one of those ways. But the other is the environment and the fact that the fashion industry, as we know, I believe every year it contributes about 10% to carbon emissions, not great. And we know that billions of pounds worth of unwanted clothes are basically sitting, if not in somebody's wardrobe, mine being one of them, then certainly on landfills. And it is becoming a major issue. So I think the brand are trying their best to encourage um, people uh, to put their stuff online rather than put it in bins because, again, all it does is affect the environment, not in a great way. So if you've got any unwanted ties or shirts, laddie, send them across and I'll put them on eBay for you. <laughs> uh, definitely. Well, I'm using all my ties, you know, at this point. Well, let's you talk could get about a few some... Naira. You could probably get a few Naira. <laughs> right. I don't mind, really. I'll, I'll just go check my, my wardrobe at this time. But what, what about market moving data are we expecting? Uh, so it's a fresh, uh, brand new week right here. It is a fresh brand new week. Of course, we had a short, we had two weeks, two short weeks uh, because of Good Friday and Easter Bank Holiday Monday. So we're on full steams ahead in London. It's quite quiet. I think the big one is, of course, going to be Friday. We're expecting GDP numbers for the month of February. Um, there was a dip in GDP. So the economy grew, I believe, about 0.2% in January. But of course, this followed um, the technical recession because we had two quarters of detracted growth. So the UK economy is in a recession, although there's been lots of market moving data we've seen since then, which does indicate that perhaps we could be out of that. Friday is very important because, of course, February is a short month. We did have an extra day for leap year, but weather wasn't great when it comes to Valentine's Day celebrations. Is this going to impact um, the data? We'll just have to wait and see. Of course, everybody now is on tenterhooks, awaiting to see when the Bank of England, led by Andrew Bailey, are going to drop those interest rates. HSBC said they do believe inflation in the UK could reach 2% in just a matter of weeks. So if the economy is moving in the right direction, then perhaps we could see interest rates falling much um, sooner than we anticipated. There are also train strikes. So unfortunately, yet again, there are going to be millions of people across the UK who have struggled to get into work at the moment. This is because of a long running dispute between the Asliff Union and the British government. In fact, they've been on the airwaves, um, the union over the past couple of hours, basically saying that they haven't spoken to anybody uh, from the transport ministry in this country for almost two years, which is ridiculous because, of course, it stops people from getting to work. And if the economy is going to move, people have got to be at their desk. So that is all impacting the market. At intraday, the all share is up, laddie. It's up by 0.12%. The FTSE 100, the UK blue chip index, that's up by 0.10%. And the FTSE 250, the domestic market, that's up by 0.33%. A lot of that movement is down to Bitcoin, which is on record highs again. I know Bitcoin's your favourite subject, um, laddie. That's definitely moved the markets at intraday as we head to that halving season. In the currencies market, the British pound is trading up against the US dollar by 0.04%, up to against the euro by 0.05%, and up against the Japanese yen by 0.16% at intraday. Right. Yeah, I guess uh, Bitcoin is back uh, back up, making uh, headlines again uh, right now. Let's see if we yeah. can cross that 72,000 um, level. We're going to be tracking that later on. Thank you so much, uh, Juliana, for the details. 
All right, let's head on to Europe now. We see Germany uh, will be one of the country's hardest hit by software giant uh, uh, SAP's uh, plans to cut 8,000 jobs uh, this year. That's SAP. Our DW correspondent, Chimbona Jimbelu, joins us now with more. Thanks for uh, joining us, uh, Chip. So what's the latest? Thanks for having me. Well, Ladi, what we know is that more than a quarter of the job cuts that SAP is planning will be here in Germany. Now that is, of course, according to a report by German business daily Handelsblatt. It reports that 2,600 of the 8,000 job cuts will be here and most of the people losing their jobs will be informed in the coming weeks. Now this news comes as SAP has been soaring at the stock market. It is Germany's most valued company. Its shares have soared more than 50% on the year. SAP's stellar performance on the DAX is linked to its restructuring plan. The company has said it is cutting jobs to intensify its focus on artificial intelligence. And that is something that has been welcomed by markets. So that is why we have seen its share price soaring in recent weeks. Are which uh, challenges does um, SAP face? Well, one of the major challenges the company faces is an increasingly unhappy workforce. It is not just that some SAP workers are looking at the prospect of job cuts. Earlier in the year, employees also complained about the company's plan to scale back remote work. SAP said it wanted them to work in the office for at least three days a week to encourage teamwork and productivity. Now, here in Germany, some employees threatened to leave the company if the policy wasn't changed. Now, it's worth, of course, noting that SAP's call to get workers back in the office isn't surprising in the corporate world. Other major companies have been doing the same. The major challenge that SAP has, though, is that it isn't performing as well as its peers. The shares of Oracle and Salesforce have soared at a quicker pace than SAP's. So the company's restructuring, which of course includes the job cuts and the increased investment in AI, those are supposed to help make it more competitive globally. All right, I'll, I'll come back to you, uh, Chip, uh, for the markets. We'll have some breaking news uh, right now. See, uh, uh, Edo State have a new um, deputy governor. He's been sworn in as uh, Mr. Mobile, uh, marvelous uh, Godwins. He's been sworn in as a new deputy governor of Edo State. And this follows the impeachment of Mr. Philip uh, Shaibu by the state assembly earlier um, today. So, uh, definitely, that's uh, breaking news um, reaching us right here. We'll get a, a profile of the new um, deputy governor. That's later on, but I think he was born in, I think, uh, 1986, and he's an engineer uh, that's uh, registered with the National Society. That's the Nigerian Society of um, Engineers. So that's it. That's breaking news there. Edo State have a new deputy governor sworn in um, right now, so it's uh, definitely official so now let's um, get back to chip now so chip how are the markets in europe looking laddie european stocks are expected to be muted today data from last friday showed that u.s jobs growth was higher than expected now that suggests that the american economy is on solid ground but while the whole jobs market it reduces the likelihood of an interest interest rate cut in june a slowdown in wage growth could be an indicator that inflation is declining. Markets will, of course, also be keeping an eye on global oil supply. While it was tensions in the Middle East that sent oil prices above $90 a barrel last week, there are other factors that could affect supply, including production cuts. And here in Germany, industrial production data for February will be released today. Markets will be watching whether manufacturers continue their upward trend from January. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Chip. Thanks for the uh, details there uh, from Europe. Let's take on some other stories in Africa now. See, commitment fees uh, paid by Kenya on untapped external loan that's hit about 833 million shillings in the six months to December, uh, driven by a weak shilling. This places cost of commitment fees in the financial year uh, for 2023-2024 and costs surpassed 1.3 billion shillings. Fees paid by borrowers to compensate for the lender for the commitment to lend and charge because the financier sets aside funds uh, for loan but cannot yet uh, charge interest pending a drawdown. 
And to Egypt now, see Egypt's annual urban consumer price inflation slow to a lower than expected 33.3% in March from 35.7% in February. And that's according to data from the country's statistics uh, agency. That's uh, CapMass. Uh, poll by 12 analysts expected an annual inflation to climb to a median of about 36 uh, point three, as uh, prices adjusted to a currency devaluation, as well as interest rate hikes in early March and an increase in fuel prices um, that was actually for two weeks to come. All right, to our next conversation now, we see remittances says to low and middle income countries that grew uh, by an estimated 3.8% in uh, 2023. And that's a moderation according to the World Bank's latest migration and development uh, brief. Join us to analyze this now as uh, Faladi uh, Yodili, CEO and uh, co-founder and founder of uh, Blaze. Join us uh, via Zoom. Uh, great to have you on the show. Well, thank you very much. Good to be here, Lani. Fantastic. So, paint a picture. Um, how much did Africans in diaspora remit home, and um, how does it compare to the previous quarters? Um, as per data that we have, um, the last report was about $100 billion was remitted back home in Africa. And then these are the ones that went to the formal um, channels, I'd say. So, and then the expectation is that the informal channels probably accounted, accounted for two to to x that so that's how it has been and then in terms of um, comparison with previous quarters what we have seen as per report is that um the compound annual growth rate has been about 12 percent in the last three years so definitely the question i mean the response to that is it's been on an upward trend people are sending money on both via formal and informal means all right compared to um diasporans outside of africa did intra africa um diaspora find it um harder or easier sending money home um, the intra-African diaspora actually have found it harder to send money back home. And then this is due to a number of factors. I think three of them I'd like to highlight quickly. And then the first one will be, of course, the usual issue with the currencies in the Africa is they're quite volatile. So it's not, um, it doesn't help the service providers in terms of pricing. That's one. And then secondly, it's in terms of non-amortization of the regulators across the continent. So unlike other markets in Europe where you have um schemes in place like passporting where if you had a license in one european country you could use that in other european countries subject to some other little tad bits processes that is not present in africa so you need to actually have each of those things which also makes people that would like to play in this space to support this burgeoning space makes it harder for them and then lastly is that there's no kind of interoperable infrastructure so like you have in europe where account numbers are i bands and works in germany works in um, France, that is not the case here. It's Momo, it's um, Echo Bank, it's all of those banking players. So it's not very interoperable. So all of these have accounted for the players to actually not have to mark up the pricing as making it difficult for the intra African remittance space and then Afri intra -Afri Africans in these spaces. And I guess that will be played into the cost of actually sending funds um, home. So, how is technology playing into the um, remittance uh, process? Any new trends uh, to look out for? I think that it is split um, in two ways. First is in the retail space. When I talk about retail space, it's for use cases such as people sending family support, money for family support, cultural and contributions to their families. So in that space, it is really uh, technology has played a role in where mobile money operators now facilitate remittance across markets. That's one. And then secondly, we also started to see um, players adopt cryptocurrency and the blockchain to facilitate these money movements. And then lastly, we've also seen things what, which I like to call conversational remittance, where we've seen players start to leverage existing platforms such as WhatsApp, Telegram to facilitate transfers between um, users or people that would like to remit money. And then on the second leg, which is for, I would say, quite sizable volumes where they're not sending money necessarily for family support, where they're probably doing it for financial obligations back home, investments, asset management. We've seen technology help with things like predictive market analysis for insights in terms of rates and how to go about it. We've also seen it um, playing um, places where they're able to schedule payments for times depending on how the market is playing. And then lastly, we've seen it play in terms of the players themselves, how they're able to optimize their operations to support this um, uh, movement of money across the continent. All right, thank you so much. But before I let you go, what are you expecting for 2024 um, in terms of remittances? I think um, it would continue to grow. Um, the contribution of remittance to um, GDPs of countries is now very... Um, 
very obvious. Some countries, it's contributed to about 14% of the total GDP in Africa. So that's, that is one. And then secondly, is that the increased adoption of mobile mobile to mobile remittance where people, and it's now deemed to be more efficient, faster and cheaper for people to move money. And then lastly, because of the uh, try to more intrinsic issues such as Africans, where there seems to be a strong um attention of family values and all of that so it would people will constantly need to send money home and then maybe lastly would be that the continent is growing the young population is growing so people will constantly move out as of the last time it was like two million africans moving out of the continent to other african countries and out of the continent annually so people all right well i guess uh, definitely uh we're trying to uh, we'll see um, if Alade was trying to uh, finish there. I'm talking about what to expect for um, remittances uh, from um, diaspora to Africa, but he's expecting it to actually grow. Thank you so much for joining us, Ifaladi Ayodele, CEO and uh, founder at uh, Blaze. All right, so yeah, breaking news again. Uh, we see um, Edo State have a, a new deputy governor at this time, Mr. Omobayo, marvelous uh, governor. That's a visual right there of his uh, swearing in. He's been sworn in as the new deputy governor of uh, Edo State and uh, definitely following the impeachment of Mr. Philip uh, Shaibu by the state assembly earlier um, today. So it's official now. Um, Edo State have a new um, deputy governor in the first of the next marvelous, uh, mobile marvelous um, goblins. And there we see him uh, being uh, sworn in there and uh, definitely. Jubilation right there as Mr. Mobile Marvelous Godman is sworn in as a new deputy governor of Edo State. All right, let's get back to the show now. Um, the markets now, we have all the markets uh, pending. And talking about the crypto market, we did hear Juliana talk about um, Bitcoin um, up again and uh, crossing that 72,000 level just like that, 3.9% um, added uh, right there to Bitcoin. Ethereum is also uh, deeper in the green, 6. Uh, six six uh, percent up this afternoon three thousand six hundred eighteen dollars and we see it's mostly green on the screen um, at this time with just really really little pockets of red let's look at the sentiment in the market now gauging how investors are feeling this market and investors are extremely greedy at 76 points i'm talking about the fear greed index showing how investors are feeling the market let's uh, bring in rume ofi now financial market analyst um, hello, Rume. Hello, Adi. Yeah, hello, so uh, quite an interesting jump there uh, by Bitcoin and Ethereum. Last time I checked, it was sub $70,000, but from nowhere, it's over $70,000. What's the driving prices today? I think uh, a lot of traders are anticipating the fact that um, they're going to be most likely two cuts uh, in 2024. So... Uh, uh, the anticipation is really, really high. Uh, this this week is very sensitive to the market as well. CPI, the ECB also is going to be speaking, and bank, and are going to be declaring a lot of their earnings uh, right from Friday. You know, so uh, even with the fact that we have some still have geopolitical uh, challenges, right there, you can see uh, all of that happening and uh, playing out. Though, but uh, the, the crypto market is ignoring all of that. You know, but. The question now is how long can this be sustainable? Uh, also, something I figured out that is actually going on, the narrative of ETF is cooling down, and also the uh, Bitcoin halving is about 10 days uh, from now. You know, So all of these uh, are actually are playing a huge role, quite different from all of the uh, all of the uh, halving, uh, pre-halving uh, season that we usually have, where we have the market dumping 20, 30, 40%. At this time, I don't think the market is actually going through that tradition. So it's giving a lot of confidence. But uh, one of the things I, I like to see that investors should pay attention in is the fact that uh, we are no longer having all of those double-digit um, Bitcoin 
uh, increase, that is, uh, people buy into the Bitcoin ETF, you know, uh, this is week 13. Uh, uh, and last week was week 13, and this week is going to be most likely 15. Uh, we're most likely going to see that to judge it, because last week, uh, Bitcoin that I bought in 3 ETF uh, about 7,000 plus as against 11, 22, 33, and all of the weeks uh, passed. So, it's actually uh, going down, but a couple of persons are not paying attention to that. They are just uh, usually carried away with all of the euphoria of the green, and um, it's worth paying attention uh, to right about now, considering the fact that these things are going to slow down. And after how few, we're also going to see if something else plays out. This is very critical for global economy right now. We can't just say that the market after how few is going to pump, considering the fact that for me, I think that the U.S. Fed is most likely not going to cut rates. They are going to be data dependent. Team most likely the end of the year. Now we are traders are betting on two cuts. At some point they are going to be one. At some point it's going to be no cuts uh, there about depending on what Jerome Powell's uh, rhetoric actually goes. So fingers crossed, everyone is watching. But please, uh, markets are supposed to be reactive. You don't preempt the market so that you don't get your fingers burned. Right, and I'm sure everybody's wondering if uh, the central bankers, that's in the U.S. and uh, maybe the U.K. and EU might actually hit that, their 2% target. But they're not far off. We'll definitely see how it, what plays out, definitely if rate cuts actually uh, play out in 2024. It's great having your perspective, uh, Rumi Ofi. Thank you. All right, so that's, that's how the market uh, is looking uh, today, talking about the crypto market and major markets that we track. But right here in uh, Nigeria, it's a holiday shortened week. Uh, that's uh, tomorrow and next tomorrow. So we know definitely the NGX is going to be closed. But that's how the markets are looking today. Um, thank you so much for watching. Remember, you can visit channelcv.com uh, for more updates. You can also watch this again on our YouTube channel. Thank you for watching. I'm Ladi Williams. And from me and the team, right here at Channels HQ, it's bye for now.